Well, good morning, everybody, um, and thank you for coming along today. My name is Rob Whelan. I'm the CEO of the Insurance Council of Australia, and uh, it's my pleasure to be your Master of Ceremonies uh, this morning. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land, the Gadigal people of the Enora Nation. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders both past and present, and to extend that respect to other Indigenous guests present here today. I need to speak up a bit because you can't hear me apparently. Um, I'm very pleased to see such a strong turn up this morning, particularly this early in the morning. It's a very good, uh, good effort on behalf of all of you because it's a very important piece of research, I think, coming at a very important time for the industry. So thank you for being so prompt this morning. Uh, some time ago, before the Royal uh, Hain Royal Commission was announced, the Insurance Council was approached by Macquarie University's Department of Applied Finance to support new research into financial services remuneration. The study was designed to investigate how various remuneration structures affect compliance with company policy. It focused specifically on how the balanced scorecard works to promote behaviour that is compliant with that policy. The Insurance Council Board decided it was an important piece of research for the industry to participate in and be involved with. Remuneration practices are complex areas involving compliance, governance, salary and incentives and of course customer outcomes. Any insights that further our understanding of how our employees can be motivated, managed and rewarded are invaluable. So we signed up along with Deloitte Australia uh, the Australian and New Zealand Institute of Insurance and Finance and the Financial S Services Institute of Australasia. This launch comes at a challenging time for the financial services sector, with the findings of the Royal Commission likely to have profound implications for the sector well into the future. Additionally, we have a very volatile political environment and an uncertain domestic and international outlook, certainly a challenging environment to be uh, delivering this research. Ensuring the viability and sustainability of the financial services sector and repairing and enhancing its reputation is top of mind and, is improving, uh, and improving remuneration practices is one part of that solution. I believe Macquarie University's research is a good step in improving our understanding of variable remuneration and whether the balanced scorecard is still serving its purpose. The Insurance Council would certainly consider supporting any further research in this area. I'd now like to introduce uh, Associate Professor Elizabeth Sheedy to present the findings of her research, Behaviour of the finance, of finance Professionals Under the Balanced Scorecard. Thanks, Elizabeth. Good morning, everybody. Um, before I start, I should just uh, make clear that while I'm the, the front person today, uh, I represent a very strong research team. Uh, my co-authors, Lila Zhang is here, if she could stand. Uh, Lila's an experimental economist. And uh, we have, uh, where's Dominic? Da yes, up the back, a visiting scholar from Germany, Dominic, who, who of course did all the work. <laughs> um, so. Let me tell you what we have discovered. So I guess it is clear to everybody that uh, non-compliance with policy is a big issue. Uh, we see it in many guises uh, and of course most particularly uh, has been made clear in the Royal Commission over the last few months. But let's not pretend this is an old issue. Uh, it has been around for a long time and I would say it's just that the interest is particularly focused at the moment. If we think about it, uh, I don't think this issue is unique to Australia, and I don't think it's unique to financial services, although I haven't done the research in other industries to confirm that, but I suspect we would find that many similar issues cropped up across other industries as well. And to be fair, there are many policies that finance professionals are expected to comply with. So if you think about the long list, you know, uh, things like responsible lending, uh, you know, credit limits, uh, anti-money laundering, cyber security, anti-fraud, the list goes on and on. So compliance 
compliance requirements these days uh, can be quite overwhelming. So setting up situations where people are most likely to comply is an enormous challenge facing the industry. So if we go back to the basics and say why is it that people may choose not to comply with policy? What is driving that? I think at the, at the core we have to say that there is this fundamental tension. On the one hand, finance professionals are expected to generate profits. That's why they're there. They have to serve shareholders. So we have to generate profits, and that involves making sales. And at the same time, we have to comply with company policies. And at times, those two objectives will be in conflict. At times, it will be necessary to reject profitable opportunities, at least in the short term, uh, in order to comply with policy. And so that's the problem that, that we're faced with. Um, now, some years ago, the balanced scorecard was proposed as a method of remuneration which was designed to help people balance those competing objectives. Uh, but it seems that there are problems. It has not, has not been an easy road. And as Rob mentioned, the purpose of this research was to try and understand a little bit more uh, exactly how the balanced <coughs> scorecard is working. Um, the original idea behind it sounds very sound. So we're working from the starting point where people previously had bonuses that were only linked to sales and profits. So the idea of the balanced scorecard was to introduce additional criteria, some non-financial measures into the mix. And the idea, you know, the, the logic of that being that it would lead to more balanced outcomes. And the idea was proposed uh, by Kaplan and Norton in the late 90s. Here in the Australian context, I think the balanced scorecard got additional impetus at the time of the Sedgwick report. So you might remember a few years ago, uh, the Australian Banking Association commissioned Sedgwick uh, to look into remuneration and uh, the Sedgwick recommendations very much supported this concept. Now, over the last year or so, I've spent a lot of time reading previous research that has been done in this field and, it, uh, and also looking at some of the uh, industry reports coming out of the UK. And I think it's clear that there are a number of implementation problems when you come to put a balanced scorecard into place. One is having just way too many criteria. So if you have eight different criteria that you're trying to uh, think about as you go about your work, uh, that, that is very likely too many to, to really juggle successfully. Uh, then we have problems to do with poor measurement. Okay. So if we think about one of the popular criteria would be to consider customer outcomes. How do you measure that? Um, it has become a very popular practice to use the net promoter score, but I think there's widespread agreement now that the net promoter score is not cl closely uh, connected to customer outcomes. It, it might measure whether a customer feels good after a particular interaction in a branch or a particular interaction with a call centre, but it's not really a good measure of the customer outcomes. So, because of the fact that it's often difficult to come up with good measures, very often what happens is that people rely on subjective measures. And often this will come down to a manager giving a rating. So you might have a criteria, something like uh, behaviour consistent with company values. And then the manager will give a rating on that criteria at the time of the annual performance review. Well, the problem there is that now we start to get exposed to all kinds of human biases. And I guess the most obvious bias is that if you're a manager and you've got a staff member who's a top performer in terms of sales, you're probably going to be very keen to keep that staff member on staff. How are you going to keep that staff member working hard? 
you're going to give them a good bonus. So you give them a good rating on any measure that is subjective. So we have this problem that this, in the subjective areas of the scorecard uh, that we're getting ratings that in fact are not balanced at all but are in fact just aligning with the sales criteria. In the worst case, you know, there has even been some evidence that uh, in, with these subjective ratings there can be collusion and extortion. I suspect those cases are much more limited. To me, the bigger problem is the, the bias problem. In this particular study, what we're doing is focusing on the problem of compliance and the fact that inevitably compliance is imperfectly measured. In other words, a lot of bad behaviour is not discovered, perhaps ever, or often for many years. So if compliance is consistently under-measured, how does that play out into this balanced scorecard system? And that was the particular issue that we wanted to focus on. Now, of course, doing this kind of research in the field is more or less impossible because, by definition, people tend to keep their non-compliance pretty secret in the field. <laughs> uh, the idea of doing a lab experiment, bringing people here, uh, is that we can monitor exactly what people are doing and we know exactly the extent of their compliance and their non-compliance. So we set up a temporary lab just uh, behind me and uh, we had uh, more than 300 finance professionals come into the lab um, during the month of September that's just gone. Uh, we guaranteed a minimum, everyone would get a minimum of $50 uh, for giving up their lunch hour. Uh, but there was the potential to earn up to $300. We paid in cash. Uh, on average, people uh, received $100 for their time. So that, uh, what we did when people came into the lab, what we attempted to do was to set up a, uh, an environment that was fairly similar to a typical <coughs> finance workplace uh, in terms of the policies uh, and the job requirements. We tried uh, a number of different treatments, if you will. So for some people, we had the balanced scorecard. For some people, we had fixed remuneration. For some people, we had uh, the compliance gateway system. And then another, uh, another difference that we tried was to look at the extent to which information about peers might make a difference to people's behavior. Okay. So let me just explain a little bit uh, what's going on here with these treatments where peer information is provided. What happened was um, uh, about halfway through the session, we had a sort of temporary halt to proceedings and we told people their ranking relative to everybody else in the room because there is some uh, there is some research that suggests that even if you have no bonuses at all, okay, if, even if there's no variable remuneration, just having a non-monetary ranking system makes people, uh, it, that in itself can bias their behaviour. So we, we thought it was important to check that out, as well as giving people their ranking in terms of sales performance. We also told them how many people in the room had been observed violating the company policy because we thought that also might have an effect on how people behaved. We're humans, aren't we? We're social creatures. We're influenced by how others are behaving. Um, so during the experiment, I should, I should explain, um, people had the opportunity to, access, to assess up to 60 transactions in 20 minutes. Of course, most people didn't finish. Um, probably on average people completed about 40 transactions. They had to do a very simple calculation, no, no more difficult than probably year eight, math, year eight maths. Uh, they did that calculation uh, and then they had to make a decision as to whether to proceed with the transaction and they had to, of course, consider whether the transaction was compliant with the policies or limits in the, in, the, uh, in the experiment. Crucially, we told them that the audit rate was 
So only 20 per cent of transactions would be checked, meaning that if they violated policy, there was a pretty good chance they would not be observed by the hypothetical audit office. Okay. So we thought that brought in a, a realistic element. Of course, as researchers, we can see all their non-compliance. So let me give you a little example of a typical transaction. So two outcomes, 60% chance of a profit of 200,000, 40% chance of a loss of 250,000. So their initial task is to calculate the expected profit and we gave them lots of um, guidance as to how to do that. We provided calculators. Uh, once they had correctly calculated the expected profit, then we said, okay, do you want to transact? In this case, the limit is that, the, or the policy is, that the loss amount cannot be more than 200,000. So this is an example of a transaction that breached the limit, and if the uh, participant was complying with the policy, they should reject it. Okay? Um, but of course, if they reject it, then that could affect their volume of sales and, and that could affect their balance scorecard rating. So let me just run through the, the different treatments in terms of remuneration. For balance scorecard, we used a very simplified version with only two criteria. Okay? And notice that these are here, it's, it's quite objective, there's no subjective element here. Okay? So on the left hand side, we have the transaction criteria. Top 10% of people receive $240, next 30% receive 80 and so forth. Then over here on the right hand side, this is the behaviour criterion, the extent to which people are compliant. So if you have a perfect uh, behaviour score with zero observed breaches, you can get up to $60 three or more breaches and you get nothing on that criteria. Then the next treatment is the compliance gateway. And the, the difference here is that uh, you don't actually receive anything positive for good behaviour. Rather it acts as a gate that allows you access to the bonus system or not. So if you're observed with three or more policy breaches, then you get no bonus at all. You only get the $50 minimum payment. So I guess that the difference here is that rather behaviour is no longer something positive that enters into the balance scorecard, but rather it's a, a hurdle that can prevent you or allow you access to the bonus system. And we understand that these compliance gateways have become reasonably popular in the industry. As far as I know, I've, we've spent quite a lot of time scouring the research literature. We've not been able to find any research on these compliance gateways. So we, we think it's quite um, groundbreaking in that sense. And then of course the fixed remuneration treatment. Uh, here, there is no benefit for breaching policy at all. Okay. So the payment is $110, that's the maximum you can receive. Uh, notice there's no link to transactions at all. Um, if you are observed breaching the policy, there is some downside. Okay. You could be penalised and cut back. Okay. But there's no benefit from violating the policy. So you would expect that under this fixed remuneration strategy that compliance rates would be very high. One other thing I'd like to mention about the experiment is that just before people started, after they had been <coughs> instructed, um, we asked them this question. In the experiment, some transactions will violate the risk policy. Some participants may choose to transact despite this. In your opinion, what percentage of your fellow participants in the experiment would always follow the risk policy? Okay. So each person had to put in their opinion about what other people would do. 
So this question about perception, we think it's, it's a potentially very important driver of people's behaviour. Remember, this is all about the norms of behaviour. And as you know, uh, this is really getting to the issue of culture. Okay? What do people think everyone else is doing? Because as social creatures, we often behave accordingly. So we wanted to see if this would be an important explanatory factor. Tell you quickly about the sample. Uh, so we had about 60% males. Uh, in terms of uh, age spread, uh, we had uh, a good mix uh, going right through. Um, I think the median age group is this one, 35 to 44. Ah, before I go further, I should explain how we got the participants. Uh, very important question. Uh, so we were very fortunate to have the support of ANZIF, the Australian New Zealand Institute of Insurance, and FINSIA. Uh, and those two professional associations were very helpful in um, notifying their members about the research. We had many people then come in to the lab as a result of that. We then took it one step further and said, for the people who came into the lab, please can you tell your work colleagues about this so that uh, they might also like to participate. Uh, and so that way, I think we have a, a very a broad sample across the industry. You'll see that um, uh, our, our sole criteria for coming to the experiment was you had to have at least six months industry experience. But as you'll see, uh, most people had a lot more than that. And so our sample, I suspect, is a probably a bit biased towards people who have more experience in the industry than not. And that's because of the fact that we um, uh, sought participants through those professional membership associations. Um, and you can see we had about 60% from ANZIF, 21% uh, from FINSIA. If you look at in, uh, industry segment, we ended up in this experiment about 56% insurance, banking and finance 16, and the other category in, is very widespread. It include brokers, superannuation, funds management, consultants, very wide range. Uh, at the end of the experiment, there was a short survey so we could ask people questions, uh, obviously demographics, and a few other control variables. So there was, uh, we asked people about their attitudes to risk, for example. So this is individual risk tolerance. We asked people questions about their attitudes to relative to performance. How important is it for you to be the best at what you do? You know, capturing that real competitive spirit that perhaps the bonus system might be feeding into. Uh, another uh, set of <coughs> survey items dealt with this issue of moral disengagement. I don't know if you've come across this construct. It's in the literature, it's been around, uh, I would say, about eight years now. And moral disengagement is proving to be um, quite predictive of workplace misconduct. These are cognitive mechanisms that people use to kind of help them kind of justify doing the wrong thing. Okay. Uh, happy to talk to you more about moral disengagement in the question time if, uh, if the opportunity arises. So here are, <coughs> here are some findings for you. So across the columns, we're looking at the, the various treatments. This one with fixed remuneration, no peer information. Uh, and we found that in this case, 75% of people were completely compliant throughout the experiment across all the different transactions. Okay. Now, I guess it's fair to say, as humans, we sometimes make mistakes. Okay. So if we have, say, a broader definition of compliance and say, well, let's just focus in on the people with fewer than three policy breaches. And that takes you to about 
So compliance rate's fairly high in that case. However, it's interesting, isn't it? It's still short of 100 per cent. So I think an important point to make is that even under fixed remuneration, you don't necessarily get perfect compliance. Uh, and perhaps what this is indicating is the fact that people are, even without bonuses, people feel quite a lot of performance pressure. Okay? They feel pressure to generate sales. Uh, uh, and that, so you could say that this is part of the culture of the environment. Even when there's no particular personal incentive, they still feel that very strong pressure. Okay. You'll notice if we compare these two columns and these two columns, you can see that the peer information actually had negligible effect. Okay. So if you look at the <coughs> statistical significance, you'll see there's no difference. Having the peer information didn't really matter to people's behaviour. <coughs> what seemed to be much more important was the actual um, remuneration system. So it's clear that when we go from fixed remuneration across here to balanced scorecard, we see a significant reduction in the compliance rate. And for the gateway system, we see a further reduction down to only 51%. The next, the next thing that we evaluated was to consider to what extent uh, people's productivity was affected by the remuneration system. Okay. So in this column, I'm looking at the average number of completed compliant transactions. Okay. So under the fixed remuneration system, it's about 19. Under balanced scorecard, slightly higher at 22. But again, that difference is not statistically significant. Okay. So that, I think, is a, an incredibly interesting facet of this study. That you know, if you remember, what was the original purpose of bonuses and incentives? is to encourage greater productivity for people to generate more transactions. Uh, and it seems that that doesn't really play out quite as you would expect. Okay? Uh, and this is the thing you know, perhaps people find most surprising because fixed remuneration is such a sacred cow of the financial services industry. For, for so long, all of us have, and I include myself, many, almost all of us, have been convinced that incentives are really important for producing lots of sales. Well, I think we need to actually start questioning that logic. It's not clear that that's really the case after all. And why might that be? Well, I, I think there's several, re several things we need to consider. One is, if people are intrinsically motivated in their job, they don't need a specific performance incentive to work hard. They will work hard anyway. So creating a workplace where people feel intrinsically motivated is, is something that we all need to, to think about. Another thing that I have felt is perhaps part of the explanation for this is the fact that when you are um, considering violating policy, that whole thought process slows you down. So you have to weigh up, you know, what's the probability of me being caught? If I am caught, you know, what are the penalties? So going through all of that process of thinking, oh, is it worth taking the risk? And then covering up, you know, hiding the crime, so to speak, all of those things actually reduce productivity. And so I think those are some of the reasons why bonuses are not as successful as you might think in terms of generating high productivity. So to me, that's, that's the thing that's really interesting about the study. It doesn't surprise me at all that compliance rates fall. Uh, that to me is kind of makes perfect sense. But what is surprising is the fact that productivity is not enhanced, not in any significant way anyway. <coughs>
Um, that we did do some regression analysis that allowed us to control for some of the other variables. Um, <clears throat> so what I can tell you there is that uh, that perception variable that I told you about earlier, yes, that was very important. Okay, one of the most <coughs> important influences on whether people complied or not was their perception of what everyone else was doing. Okay? So this brings us back to culture. Okay? This brings us back to the idea we have to work hard on changing people's perceptions about what is the behavioural norm. We also found that moral disengagement was very significant in determining whether people were complying or not. Okay? So the people that uh, we, we see this as more or less a personality type, people that are more easily morally disengaged, they are the people that are more likely to violate policy. We also found that professional membership was uh, relevant to some extent, particularly in the case of uh, the Finzia members. Remember, this was only 20% of our sample, but we did find that the Finzia members were uh, more likely to comply with policy than, than others who came into the lab. So I guess that's an, an intriguing finding to suggest that you know, some of our notions about professionalism, uh, you know, that there could be something important there. I think that's definitely worth exploring further. So, um, to wrap up, uh, I guess I just want to reiterate the points. Uh, yes, remuneration matters for compliance, uh, but not too much for performance in, uh, in terms of productivity. So that's, a, a, to me, a finding that is very intriguing. And I think it's fair to say that it has to, uh, you know, the industry has to really ask some difficult questions about whether it can continue to justify the ongoing use of variable remuneration. Uh, then I think another important finding from the study is the whole issue of culture. <coughs> We're finding more and more evidence that behavioural norms are very important for people's behaviour. Um, the finding about moral disengagement, this is something I would like to take much further in ongoing research. Um, we, we know that moral disengagement is important. What we don't really know is how to make people more engaged. Okay? Is it possible to make people more engaged? What would be some of the mechanisms for doing that? So as you can probably see, uh, I'm very keen to do further research in this space. Uh, I think uh, what we have done is, uh, I think, genuine, genuinely groundbreaking, particularly the, the finding about the compliance gateways, which has not been researched at all in the past. Uh, I hope that you find this kind of research useful. Uh, I guess I'd like to throw out the challenge to the industry. How much better it would have been if, before implementing the balanced scorecard, if we had done the research in the lab then, okay, you know, checked it out you know, in lab conditions, you know, it's not that difficult to run this kind of lab experiment. And it seems like it's a really important thing to do before you take a new remuneration system out into the field where it's going to affect people's lives. And, and not just the lives of your staff, but it's going to affect potentially the lives of your customers. Uh, I, I would really like to throw out that challenge that, you know, can we please try and test things out more thoroughly before we rush to implement? Uh, that, and I hope that, you know, we would love to partner with you in, in that kind of ongoing research uh, to hopefully uh, make the industry um, a better version of its current self. So uh, I will pause there. Um, Lila is going to come to the lectern and join me. We're going to have uh, a time of, of uh, questions and answers. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I've got myself out of kilter. I'm so sorry. You come later. Sorry. That's all right. I, I knew there was a good reason there we had an MC. Some, uh, there is a reason, yes. <laughs>
that, that's that's fascinating stuff. I, I'm I'm particularly interested in this moral disengagement issue that you've discovered, um, and I'd love to hear more about how you might research that and whether this is actually a hardwired part of people's uh, certain people's DNA. Um, that would be fascinating, I think. Um, so thank you, Elizabeth, for a fascinating. A piece of research, and as uh, she intimated, that um, there will be Q and A uh, following uh, the next session. Um, I'd like to introduce now um, Michael Williams, who's a partner with Deloitte, to comment uh, on the research. Michael works with the financial services industry clients in all areas of human capital. He has worked extensively in the Asia Pacific and European regions across business transformation, organisational design work transition, change management, HR transformation, finance transformation, cost reduction and post-merger integration. A formidable background. Michael, up to you. Thank you, Rob. I think I need to make that bio a little saucer. Um, perhaps not covering everything. Um, in fact, maybe I make it a little longer. I might just add every single project I've ever done um, into my bio. Thank you uh, for the introduction, Rob, and, and welcome everybody. And thank you for, for getting up so early for this uh, this event. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Elizabeth, Lila, and Dominic on this uh, exceptional work. I think they've done a really, really good job and uh, a very worthy contribution uh, to this topic. And I'd also like to congratulate them on their timing, because they couldn't really have manufactured the timing any better, could they? Given uh, yesterday's uh, Royal Commission hearings and um, anyone who's interested in this topic could do worse than uh, either tuning in live this morning to uh, Mr Common or, um, and, and I should say reading the transcripts of, of, of all of these discussions. It's, uh, it's, it's very topical and relevant. So what I wanted to do just uh, over the course of the next few minutes is just uh, share a few of my perspectives on the topic and rather than try to give an industry, a total industry perspective which would be far too difficult and as I said there are far more qualified people in the world on that topic giving their perspectives on it uh, right now. I thought I'd just share a few of my reflections, having, uh, having um, been on the journey with Elizabeth and her team over the last, the last few months. Um, and, and I should also acknowledge that Grant McKinnon and, and Deb Moore from the Insurance Council were also involved um, in, in supporting uh, this research from an industry point of view. Um, the, the, I think the first thing to note is that really everybody has a view on this topic. And you'll hear people say things like, what gets measured gets done, which is a very common you know, phrase that people would use or a common you know, truism, if you will, it's considered that way at least. Um, people will say things that, that reflect inherent beliefs about how we respond to incentives and, and, and targets and measures. Um, and those inherent beliefs need to be challenged. And I think that's been one of the, the big takeaways for me from this whole process is how much we actually question those underlying beliefs that we hold about what motivates humans to do their best um, and in what contexts those, uh, those levers of motivation really have impact and really work. Um, I think it's, it's probably worth just starting off by saying there's a few things as I reflect on the research that I found particularly surprising or at least you know, that challenged my perceptions. Uh, the first is around, I think, that idea of compliance, um, perhaps not being quite as high as we would have expected it to be in all of the different treatments. I thought when we started this work and when we heard about the design of the treatments, one of the first things that we expected to see was a, a much higher level of, or degree of compliance um, without uh, the incentive uh, compensation structure attached to the balance scorecard environment. And I thought that was, that was surprising and I think the, you know, the takeaway for me for that was really to what extent do we have this kind of performance orientation, this performance pressure um, so ingrained in our corporate culture, so part of the way we work every day regardless of the system of measure around us um, of the day, um, that it actually is just a, a foundational element of, of how we work. And maybe there's a, a lot of questions we have to ask, and one of the things I wanted to, to reflect on in this conversation was what are some of the um, ways of designing work environments that actually can start to shift that um, inherent belief that, uh, that, that of that performance orientation that's so foundationally ingrained in all of our uh, mindsets and behaviours of our people. So that was the first observation for me, that, that surprise around the degree of compliance, that it was still well below 100% uh, in these treatments. Um, one of the other things that I found a little bit surprising, I think, was that um, the productivity difference actually wasn't particularly significantly different under all of the different treatments. Again, one of our inherent beliefs, and when I looked at the initial treatment design, 
my assumption was that um, under the incentive compensation model, um, there'd be a, a higher degree of productivity, a more activity, more um, performance orientation driven or um, motivated by that, by that structure. But, but again, it didn't seem to, to be the case. And uh, you know, again, perhaps that reflects the kind of the underlying performance orientation that's already in our businesses, but also perhaps makes us think about some of the other <coughs> factors that, um, that really motivate and drive, um, drive performance. And, and I think they also uh, lend a, a view to how we should think about future research in this, in this area. I think those two areas around um, the way we actually turn up to work and what we really believe is important in our work is something that I think warrants further research and consideration by both the industry um, and research bodies like, uh, like Macquarie. So I think that they're two things that I found a little bit counterintuitive when I, when I saw the work. Um, what I was also thinking about is when we do work in this space and we talk to clients about the operation of their balanced scorecard models. Um, one of the things we see often is actually that perhaps the current experience in industry of balanced scorecard is actually not a great test for its design because I think that um, when we look at the operation of these scorecards in many instances, actually they're not, they're not well implemented. Um, and just to give you a simple example, if you it, what I would often do when I look at an initial scorecard and, and try to work out if it's actually having an impact um, in a balanced way, uh, at least in the sense that it's designed to do, what we might do is a simple correlation analysis between the various dimensions of the scorecard and the overall performance outcome. So what you should expect to see is a reasonably similar degree of correlation between each of the individual measures that are, or metrics that are designed into the scorecard and the overall performance outcome. That would be a thing that you would expect to see if the balanced scorecard was operating in a truly balanced way. But I think what we actually see in practice is very often a very um, high degree of correlation in the overall performance outcome with the most objectively measurable uh, KPI, which is usually the financial or productivity based measure, and a fairly low degree of correlation with the overall performance outcome with the non-financial or less objective measures. And Maybe that's related to the kind of quality of the measures. Usually the non-financial measures tend to be a proxy or tend to be a kind of a weaker measure of the thing they're intending to, to reflect. But also, I think they also rely heavily on, and we see this very often, that there's a very high reliance on subjective management decision making. And I think Elizabeth called out the inherent biases that very often impact the way managers make those decisions. And so what we often see is managers typically rate most of their people very close to each other um, and there's very little differentiation in the way they uh, measure their people on those non-financial metrics. And that's, I think that's a real issue in terms of the quality and capability of, of managers. First of all, the quality of the measures themselves, but also the capability and willingness of, of management to really differentiate um, on the basis of those uh, non-financial measures. I think there's a big opportunity. If you are a firm believer that the Mellon Scorecard is the way forward and is a, a, a strong um, basis for um, measuring and, and motivating performance, then you would certainly want to believe that actually more can be done in terms of the design of the scorecard and the operation of the scorecard itself. Because I think what I've seen over the last few years is that the actual um, implement, implemented scorecards that we often see in the financial services industry is just not functioning very well and could do with a, a significant uh, challenge. So. I think that's a, that's a kind of a reflection from my own experience in looking at the function of these scorecards. And of course, when you attach remuneration or compensation to those performance outcomes, all the weaknesses in the scorecards are, uh, you know, of course, are also reflected in the outcomes of that, that relationship as well. So it just continues the, um, let's say, the weakness in the overall design and implementation of this, of this framework. So it's not necessarily a test of is it a good idea to have a balanced scorecard, but I certainly think that the actual operation as it's been intended to be uh, designed hasn't really been very successful in the uh, industry over the last few years. So rather than, so the question then is what next? I mean, what should the, the future hold for this type of uh, measurement framework and these measurement and incentive systems? And I think it would be difficult to um, try to give everyone a simplistic answer on what that might look like right now. But um, I certainly think that there's an opportunity to do some work around the actual operation of these scorecards and design of these, these measurement frameworks, the broader measurement and analysis frameworks that we have in, our opera in the operation in our businesses. 
And also, potentially even, you know, I think we can see that the industry is definitely moving towards a decoupling of remuneration and incentives from financial performance. That's, those, those directions are very, very clear um, right now. And in fact, I think, again, if you listen to the Royal Commission today, you'll hear more of that conversation, I suspect, um, happening. And the only interesting thing about that for me, it really is the extent to which the industry really requires some kind of regulatory impetus to make those changes or whether or not anyone's willing to take the uh, risk of being a first mover in that, in that space. I suspect it's probably the former rather than the latter based on um, international experience and, and based on um, the words of uh, some of the leaders of some of the big institutions um, at the moment. Um, so finally what I wanted to do was just think about this concept of engagement and what, what might be some of the factors driving it. And um, so when I looked at some of the research that we've done over the years on employee engagement and the things that motivate great working environments, there were, there were five factors that really stood out in the research that we did. And they're all things that potentially could be um, subject to further research or further analysis. But I think as we reflect on them, we would do well to think about how we could actually bring some of these conditions to life in our organisations. So the first factor is really the design of good, meaningful jobs. You know, the degree to which our people have the autonomy, um, the time, uh, the capacity to do the work they want to do uh, really well because you know that inherent desire to do good work is quite common. I think we see it in particularly in frontline or customer service environments. There's a very common and uh, well, I would say in my observation a lot of uh, desire to do the right thing um, by customers but of course the environments in which that we create for people tend to be highly pressurized and metricated and stressed out so reducing that um, that that stress factor um, in our working environments could be a, a, an opportunity to, um, let's say, change the, the, the context to some degree. Um, another um, factor is, is, is great management, really good coaching. Um, so having an environment where managers are very, very well trained at coaching their people who focus on um, really bringing the, um, the growth orientation to the way they coach and support their people, rather than focusing on relying and leaning on the metrics um, and the measures to do their work for them, actually really um, step up to coaching and supporting the development and performance of their people. I think that's a real opportunity and we see time and time again um, coaching models in industry being um, too light um, and the, ma the managers in those environments being so focused on the numbers um, and not as much focused on the actual performance of their um, people that the, the actual value of that management is, is lost. So there's an opportunity there as well. Um, the third factor I think that's really important is growth opportunity. I think that, um, again, when we look at the research about why people uh, leave organisations, the research that looks at why people um, lose their uh, engagement in, in their performance um, in organisations, that lack of growth opportunity is a really big factor. Um, and if you think about the next kind of five to ten years in financial services as we expect to see a great deal more automation um, and uh, change in the workforce composition, size and shape, um, I think what we'll see is a greater need and a greater exposure for people who haven't got the broad capabilities that are going to be required to be successful in the next era of financial services. So actually it's not just a, a valuable thing from an engagement point of view, I think it's an imperative for all organisations to focus heavily on learning, development, and capability growth for their people. That's the third thing. The fourth um, thing is, is the fourth component or aspect of a great environment is a flexible and inclusive environment. So again, we see organisations that create the possibility for all their people to give their best, um, to have a voice, to be heard, um, to contribute to the design um, and execution of, of what they do for their customers. Um, typically do a lot better, um, and, but again, what we see is very few organisations are, are willing to put the time and energy and focus into creating an inclusive and flexible environment for their people. So that's another key component. And I think the fifth component is around trust in leadership. So that belief that people have in the mission and the alignment they have with the mission of their leaders is a really important factor um, in employee engagement. And again, I think we've seen that's been missing um, we know that's probably missing in a lot of our, the institutions that we work in at the moment um, in, in Australia, and I think that uh, you know, there's a real opportunity and a need for that. 
Um, and, and I think that, that topic of trust is actually what really this is all about from an industry perspective, that ultimately the, um, the, 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 the gap in trust in our institutions at the moment in, in, in Australia is an issue, um, not just because it will likely result in more regulation, um, but actually because for industry participants it's going to be more of an imperative. You know, we think in an, let's imagine in an open banking type environment we expect customers to have more choice um, and that we think that their trust in institutions will be a factor in the choices that they make. So from a competitive standpoint, trust will become a competitive, more of a competitive factor in um, customer choice and, and, and workforce choice in the future. So I think if for no other reason than it being an absolute competitive imperative, organisations should think deeply about how they can great, create greater degrees of trust. And I think those are the reasons why I think this type of research is extremely important and why it's so important that um, research bodies like this actually continue to do this work and, that, and why industry should also take a role in participating in that research and, uh, and, and doing more of their own, more of their own questioning, if you will, of some of those underlying assumptions. Thank you. Thanks, Michael, for those further uh, challenging uh, thoughts uh, stimulated by the research. So now we're going to have some <laughs> Q&A. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Lila Zhang, who is a co-author of this research and a lecturer in economics. We just need to acknowledge our wonder wonderful industry partners. <laughs> Could I ask the industry partners just to, to come forward so we can uh, give them a big thank you. Michael, Louise, and is Anita here? Uh, Chris, uh, Mary? Yes, we would like to thank them. We couldn't have done this work without them. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, uh, please join me in thanking the partners for making this research possible.